Hello. Um, does this microphone work? Yeah. yeah. Good. I'm so confused about having carpet on, uh, having like lawn on the floor. It's like, I go a lot to accessibility conferences and I just think about the people who would have their guide dog with them and they would be so confused. <laughs> this is just not right. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Chris, I live local, uh, that's why this morning my train station had a bomb scare, that's why I was rather late. I came from a conference yesterday in Germany, so my accent might be all over the shop right now because I had to speak three languages for two days and I still don't know where I am and what I am. Um, and I just came here today to talk about a bit what's going on in the Node world and where I see the Node world as a JavaScript guy as a great opportunity that we should be embracing much more. But I feel we've been separated from the rest of the JavaScript world and the rest of the programming world with Node a bit. Whereas we're like the hottest thing on the planet right now and we should be more embracing with other people's ideas. After this very vague intro, um, this is me, Chris Harmon, Code Poet on Twitter. So if you need any information about JavaScript, hedgehogs, or, or kitten pictures, this is where you find me, and this is where you can also tell me things as well. It's very important to give feedback to speakers because we're lonely people who normally live in the basement of our parents, and we want to know how we actually came across and what we did here. I want to make seven points uh, in nice rainbow colors because I want us to go away with this with an enthusiasm about doing something nice here and about changing our ways a bit because I think we're much more in, uh, too much introspection going on right now and not much understanding that what we're doing here could impact the outer world much more. Moving from Mozilla to Microsoft, one thing I learned most is that I know not much about what developers do out there. Because we're all here with these wonderful, cool machines. We're all in our environments where we can control the build process, where we can control the rolling out of different machines, where we control the language of the people that we work with. And the world is not working that way. There's a much larger wor world out there that needs our knowledge, but we get, instead we get riled up shouting at each other who's got the best practice this week and that next week is considered harmful and these kind of things. So let's talk a bit about JavaScript first. When you look at uh, JavaScript, and I've done that for years and years, I professionally used JavaScript for five years, got lots of money, well, got money for it, and then I wrote my first JavaScript book, and then I understood what I was doing. It was really good. So by, by, by teaching, I learned, and I understood that randomly I managed to do the right things, but I didn't quite understand what I was doing, but we still don't, and that's the cool thing about it. It's a very, very complex it's a very simple language that confuses a lot of people because of its nature. The good thing about JavaScript is was that it made the, the web much more interactive. And that started with just not sending off a form, but actually telling you, oh, you have to fill in this field before you send the form off. Then we had like pop-up windows, frames, these kind of things. That's how long I've been doing that, since 1997. Like when people are like, oh, this has to work in Netscape 4 and Internet Explorer 5. What are you going to do? I'm going to go to the pub and drink. <laughs> this is what I'm going to do. It's easy to learn without any tooling overhead. Use whatever you want. This is why I learned JavaScript. I didn't want to spend money on Borland and C Builder. I just wanted to use a text editor and write something in it because I'm a cheapskate and I didn't have any money. So I just realized this language is free, the documentation is free, I can use any editor I want, and we can spend months telling each other which is the best editor and uh, write a new one because the last one didn't have the right colors and these kind of things. It doesn't need any compilation or conversion step. It works straight in the browser. That's what I liked as well. I used to do assembly language on Commodore 64 and Amiga. And it was always quite fun to write my code and then go for a coffee and learn a language and go on a quick holiday and come back and then see that the thing actually didn't work. <laughs> With JavaScript, it was much easier. I put in the browser. It said, like, something's wrong. And then I put an alert in there, because that's all the debugging we had. And Great, now I know what I didn't do because it says undefined is not defined, and you're like, okay. <laughs> it's a forgiving and dynamic language that allows for a lot of different and adventurous development styles. And this is the fun thing. Everybody's like, this is the one way to write JavaScript. Nah. I mean, this thing runs on everything. And you're allowed to write in your, in your format or in another format. It's amazing how we get excited about a semicolon. <laughs> you know, and how many people turn out to be colons talking about that far too long. It just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, there's several, there, there's space for everybody. Looking at PHP, you can be very creative in your coding styles, or even documentation, or method naming. It's fine. 
as long as the thing is predictable and it is consistently in one way or another, I'm okay with that. That's what we have tooling for. That's why we have computers for, to turn one coding style into another if it's consistent. If you mix and match them, that's interesting. That's what we call 10 times developer. <laughs> so these are the positive things about JavaScript. The problematic things about JavaScript is that it made the web much more interactive. So instead of just having a form field, we just made everything scroll around and pop up in your face. And, uh, and uh, I mean, I work uh, for Microsoft right now, and the amount of like SharePoint sites where I click on something and I see a spinner, and I don't know if the thing hung now, or if the server is there, or if I got fired, or what's going on, <laughs> because there's no feedback mechanism whatsoever, because you do everything with JavaScript. It's easy to learn without any tooling overhead. Use whatever you want is also one of the bad things about it because we don't have any consistency. As I don't like IDEs, but now I work with Microsoft people and it's just amazing how much time I spend working for Mozilla on developer tools. And I see people using Visual Studio and they have all these tools already built in, in, into the editor. And I'm like, this is cool. But I never looked at it because of that. IDEs is people that click on ads and things, you know, like people, <laughs> it's just not us, you know. It doesn't need any compilation or conversion step. It works straight in the browser. It's also a bad thing because you don't know the browser. That's the biggest problem. But it's not a big problem. It's actually the power of the web. You cannot control what your end users are using to look at your stuff. Your job is to make this available to them. That's why we get paid for it. This is what work is about. Not our users actually changing their ways because of us, because normal, most of the time they cannot change their ways because they're locked into some environment or they have an Android phone that just came with a terrible old browser and you can't even up, uh, download another one for it. It's forgiving and dynamic language that allows for different adventurous development styles is also a problem because when you, your development style is not uh, uh, predictable, you will have a lot of code that's unmaintainable and we know how we do this. We go a project and they're like, nah, I'm going to rewrite this. And like, how long will it take? Uh, don't ask me about time. You know, like, it's just unbelievable how many times we just look at stuff. It could take us an hour to understand it, but now, nah, now, nah, let's write a new one instead. Okay, I loved this yesterday. Mama said life is like a dynamic language. You never know what the hell is going on. <laughs> <laughs> Dynamic languages are gorgeous for us as developers because we can do whatever we want. They're really terrible in terms of memory consumption and hunger to the machine. And we just, uh, I mean, when you, when you do a variable in JavaScript, it could be an integer, it could be a string, it could be a blob, it could be a boat, it could be an elephant. We don't know. And you can even change it from an elephant to a boat if halfway through if you wanted to. So when, you, when it comes to running JavaScript on IoT devices where you got like 128 meg of, uh, of memory, that's not a good thing. That's why we have to have languages that are much stricter about this. The other problem about JavaScript is that in comparison to all the other web standards, it's not fault tolerant. What does that mean? HTML, I don't close a p tag, the browser closes it for me. I put an element in there that's called uh, uh, HTML is stupid, and it will just render the content of that element and not try to do anything else with that element. CSS, when there's a line of invalid CSS, the parser goes meh and goes to the next one. Uh, invalid line of JavaScript, oh my god, God has forsaken us, the house is on fire, I'm not going to do anything anymore, you're done. So that's why it was always fragile to use JavaScript in a browser environment. And browsers are gorgeous, gorgeous things, but they all do different bits and bobs as well. And that was the biggest problem that people had. Like, oh my god, that browser does something different to the other browser. And you're like, yes, that's why you get paid for doing work there, to understand this. Sadly enough, in the past, my main career was knowing which browser messes up how, where. And luckily enough, this is over. With like evergreen browsers, we don't have these issues any longer. I joined Microsoft to kill Internet Explorer. That's what I said in my job interview, and I still got the job. <laughs> And we did. And we now have an evergreen browser there as well. So the whole excuse of like, oh, I have, I have people that have Internet Explorer 8. And you're like, well, do you test in it? No, I just have people that, compl that complain it doesn't work. So no, then don't support it. Give it HTML and CSS. Don't give it any JavaScript. These, com these browsers are retired. They should be in the park playing football or something. You shouldn't actually, you shouldn't actually play with them any longer. They're just, and people that have to use Internet Explorer 6 and 7 are not used to beauty. Don't. <laughs> the
The problem is when we talked about web standards, and I, I, I make myself a few enemies because I've been part of the web WASP group and the, the, all, the, all the movements. We always talk about these web standards, but then you look at what browsers really did over the time, and the web standards were always a, part, a big part of it and a smaller part of it, and it shifts away all the time right now. So the standards are one thing, what, what browsers do is another thing. So shifting from what browsers do into a standard is something that is very, very broken right now. Instead of, instead of learning from browsers and putting it back into a standard, we just make these two things fight with each other when it's like, oh yeah, only old people use web standards. And you're like, no. This is, by the way, a visualization of the data site that we just released, which is all the APIs in CSS at the moment, or the CSS support in different browsers. So you can visualize different parts uh, and see how much overlap is in different browsers and different environments. So browsers are all broken and annoying, so let's fix all the things ourselves. That's every half year somebody will tell you, oh, the DOM is shit, browsers are crap, we actually have to write our own virtual DOM and our own UI library, so we render everything out in JavaScript because then we have control over everything until we leave the project and somebody else looks at it and says, I don't like that framework, I'm going to put the next framework in there. So the amount, of, the amount of cruft that we put on the web because we try to fix browser issues on the JavaScript side all the time because we think we're amazing developers, sometimes we get lucky. Sometimes it works out, but most of the time we have a short-term solution for something that should be fixed in the long term. <laughs> there is a phenomenon that I call the full-stack overflow developer. Which are people that just look up things, copy and paste them, and then sell them for money, and then run away. And uh, I loved that the other day when somebody said, like, that's the one true JavaScript exception handler is try something, catch, window location, href, stack, overflow, search, question for this kind of thing. <laughs> of course, when somebody does this, somebody else writes it in ES6 and makes it much, much shorter. <laughs> <laughs> so, but this is rampant. We, we, we don't even document our stuff anymore. We just find the first answer and copy and paste it in and then wonder when there's security problems, wonder when there's, uh, there's issues with maintenance. There's also the blaming the user thing out there where it's like, if all my users had the same computer as I had, then everything would be nice. Well, buy them computers, send them out there. That's the only way you can actually make that happen. There's also the temporary workarounds, which is always quite fun as well. Like, we fix this now, and then you get time later to fix it biggest lie that you ever hear from any program manager. It's a bit like I, I read the terms and conditions. No, you didn't. And the same way you can never fix things later as well. And trying stuff until it works is, of course, another big thing that we're doing right now. Let's change some numbers around, and that's probably how that thing works. OK, it doesn't break. Fair enough. Pop time. This is in the Spotify office in Stockholm the other day. I saw that. They keep the door open. They, the, the button didn't quite work anymore. So they put this thing there, and then they put the spanner down there on the back. And this, to me, is the state of JavaScript on the web right now with a lot of our <laughs> frameworks that we're having. Because we patch on top of patches on top of patches on top of patches. The amount of like the, the Webpack systems and the, the packaging systems, Gulp, Grunt, Barb, fur, fur, Burp, Fart, whatever these things are called by now, <laughs> all of them fix issues we shouldn't have programmed in. You know, all of these undo bad things that we did before. Oh, you used 15 libraries. We can gzip that for you. That's totally fine. Look, the, the footprint is not high any longer. The execution time on the machine is huge, and the, the processor just cries out and wants to go home. But it's all fine now because the original packaging looks nice. That's why Node was such an exciting thing to happen. I worked in Yahoo when Node came out, and we were the first to take YUI 3 because it didn't have a DOM and rendered uh, components on the server and on the client. And it was, it was huge on like first generation iPhones because it was just an HTML stream being displayed rather than trying to render the JavaScript on the device itself. And I, I got really excited about this because it was just like, OK, we now have an environment where we control things and we can make JavaScript better. With Node, we liberated ourselves from the woes of the web. We didn't have the problem of different browsers anymore because we control the environment. So we concentrate on using JavaScript to build all kinds of things, microservices, bespoke servers, huge applications. We, with like Electron, we build most of the stuff that's running on my machine right now. And it, that's great. That's just wonderful, because for the first time, we can run JavaScript not in the unknown, but in the partly known. And the problem that we had with that, though, was we control the environment that gives us too much control sometimes and too much uh, assumptions as well. We can innovate the approach to using JavaScript, and we can imitate, build upon, or improve what other languages do. 
I was fascinated how many Ruby and Python people kept asking me why JavaScript is not like their language. And they're like, because it's another language. <laughs> you know, very simple. It's just had, had different use cases, different ideas, just because the one thing you like. I mean, I wrote Perl. I know unreadable code. <laughs> You know, not a problem. And very short, you know, like, so don't tell me that your JavaScript language is shorter than mine. <laughs> One of the things we did with Node was taking on a lot of needless dependencies, and that's really dangerous. The amount of, like, NPM installs where I have, like, 15 screens of scrolling thing, and every third one is a warning that is not a problem then afterwards. And I'm like, okay, I just, now I can color the background of the website differently. And why do I have these 27 NPM modules now on my machine that I didn't have before? We're getting into a world where we have a brittle environment that we depend on too much. The other problem, of course, is we limited ourselves to one JavaScript engine. V8 is the engine of Node, or was the engine of Node, and everybody's like, okay, cool, so we write towards that engine. Monoculture is never a good plan. I know, Microsoft guy, but yeah. It <laughs> That's why they hired me, to basically make sure that they don't do it again. Get the angry German ginger guy. And, uh, and I find that really depressing. I'm like, I was amazed that working Mozilla, that we never did a, uh, an engine or a, well, there was, a, there was a test run thing, but we never did an engine for Node. Everybody just assumed V8 is the only thing ever to run Node on. And this is just dangerous to me because engines get bloated over time and no competition in an engine market makes sure that your, brow that your engine becomes lazy or that too many people work on it, there are security things going in. It's really dangerous to have one machine only. We build towards the capabilities of one engine instead of the standard as well. A lot of the stuff that I see in Node, every time there's a change in the environment, it breaks because it assumes things of the engine. We can still do an if statement around that one, or you can actually uh, look at the standard and see what works there. We run into the danger of relying too much on dependencies, see left pad, I mean, that was just painful. And it wasn't only painful on a technical level, it was just the amount of social ineptitude of everybody involved that was the fanboy of that conversation. Not the people involved, but like the hatred that was going left and right on the web after this was just like, really, do we, are we that bored? You know, shouldn't we like each other much more and do cooler things and hippie horse shit and whatever? And politics and harsh, very engineering sky driven approach. I, as a JavaScript developer that was mostly fr uh, front-end browser thing, every time I get to node meetings, I'm just like, cool. I have no idea what you just said, but that looks awesome. And uh, we need to be much more inviting. We need to be nicer to, to starting people and not just like, okay, here's the 50 dependencies you don't understand, don't worry about this. This doesn't help me as a new developer because I don't get the confidence of having done something myself. I just used things I don't understand to put things together and then I get praised for it. That's a terrible feeling. That's like getting somebody else, singing somebody else's music and saying, like, you do it better. Hey, it works. It's another big thing that I keep hearing. Like, uh, does, what's going on there? It works. Don't touch it. It's all good. You know, like, we had PHP servers like that before as well. So what I really want to do is make ES6 happen, because the mess that is JavaScript right now, with ES6 we have a new cutoff point. We have a language that is now finally ratified, that is a web language, and we could do something really, really good in that. But we're not quite there yet because people keep saying, oh, old browsers, what do we do about them? What do we do about this? In the Node world, you don't have that problem of supporting old browsers. You can use ES6, you can use newest features of JavaScript in a much more reliable manner. It's a great opportunity to clean up our act as a JavaScript community. We have a ratified standard. The standard has truckloads of good features that make library usage unnecessary. Just templating now in JavaScript, wonderful. Why do I need to have an extra templating language? Why do I need to have all these array method, uh, uh, extra, extra functions, these kind of things? They're all now in the language, and that's what I like most about it. It's a great opportunity to revamp our educational materials and fade out old bad advice. And I tell them, oh yeah, where should I learn JavaScript? If it says JavaScript, don't read it. Including my books, sadly enough, but nobody reads them anyways after a few years. But uh, if, it's a, if it's something that shows you the new features and how to implement them, that is a great opportunity. We need to get rid of bad, bad materials. The amount of people that I work with that are nine to five developers that just go to Google, find the first result, copy and paste it, and tutorial from 1972. And they're like, okay, that's probably how it works. It's very, very bad. I mean, I was, I was screaming the other day in the office when I overheard a C-sharp developer was like, oh, CSS is easy, just put an important at the end of it. <laughs> and that's a normal practice. And you're like, really? 
So JavaScript history was interesting. We had like 1997 ECMAScript 1, 1998 ECMAScript 2, 1999 ECMAScript 3, and then stuff happened. I think the Star, uh, I think the Transformers movies came out and things, and people got confused, and then Flash and kind of things, and ECMAScript 4 got abandoned, and then that feels so sad about the abandonment. Uh, ECMAScript 5, and now we got ECMAScript 6. And ECMAScript 6 has all these really cool things in it, all of them for different environments. There's not one single JavaScript developer. Every JavaScript developer works in different environments and does different tasks. That's why the language has so many cool things that are applicable to some but not the others. So telling people you need to use this, you don't know. Ask them what kind of environment they work in and then it may be a bad idea to use this that you think is so amazingly cool. The support for ES6 is getting better and better, and I'm happy that this is an old screenshot. Most of these are not, uh, are not read anymore. I'm ex incredibly excited. Everybody lo loves to bash on Apple right now, but now that WebKit Nightly has full ES6 support as well since last week, it's really good. So with ES6, even, uh, even iOS is on the case, and we can use these things in the Safari browser or in the web view there. Of course, uh, when you don't want, uh, when you don't have an environment that supports it, what most people do is transpiling with like Babel.js or some of the others out there. And this is a great solution. This is a really good solution. But I think the problem is the more we transpile, the less we can actually test ES6. Because it's this like, we have a browser that supports ES6, but it never gets ES6 because everything gets transpiled for everybody out there. In, your, in the case of Node, not the problem anymore because you, instead of like sometimes performance is a good thing. But it's quite funny when, when you have people looking at JavaScript for the first time, it's like reading JS code that ends with this. And Perl has a bad punctuation <laughs> reputation and that's I think a Webpack output at the end of it. So people even don't understand that our code generated should not be looked at by humans or even should be looked at by other machines. But we, there's an education problem there. The other problem is, of course, when we do transpilation, we have, again, an overhead. So this is this wonderful comparison website there that tells you how much uh, file size it has, what's the JS compilation, how long it takes in milliseconds, and what's the runtime of the tool as well, depending on which of the ones that you use. So it's, again, measuring, like, is it worth it, or is it actually uh, just because of 0.2% of my users, I put this extra 10 seconds of wait or 20 milliseconds of load on my server. And then it gets interesting when we started uh, talking about Chakra Core because we wanted to have a new JavaScript engine in Internet Explorer because the old one basically was 10 years old and terrible. And uh, we wrote a new JavaScript engine from scratch and then we thought we need a lightweight one of that one as well because we have IoT devices, mobile devices, these kind of things. And it was interesting when, uh, when Isaacs was saying like that 42% of Node.js users use Windows as their desktop environment more than any single Unix. And that shocked me as well, because I didn't expect it as well. But then I go to Poland, and I go to Brazil, and I go to anywhere that's not England or America, and people sit there with their Windows boxes uh, or their Linux machines. And I'm like, excellent. This is good. So we have an audience that we totally ignored because we're too excited about working on this very open, no, wait, on this machine. <laughs> Chakra Core is now available to PowerNode. Right now on Windows, uh, soon also on Linux, uh, not on OS X because we, we concentrated on making it work on Linux first because the code running in the world is not going to be on OS X machines. The code running in the world is going to be on Linux machines and that's why we wanted to support that first. And I think it's a breaking of the monoculture of V8. V8 is open source, I know it's all good, but it's still one engine. And we wouldn't have any web standards if there were only one browser. We need more than one engine in browsers so we can actually validate our assumptions of standards being a good thing. And we need the same thing in JavaScript. It's highly optimized to run in low-end environments. It's a brand new engine without overhead from old browser dependencies. So it's, it, all the old, uh, old Internet Explorer crap is not in that engine any longer. It was so fun seeing developers delete code and be very, very happy for a change and go home and like, I deleted shit today. This is amazing. No more VML. No more, no more uh, uh, like, uh, 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 what, is, what was the other stuff that was really document modes and these kind of things. All this stuff is out. And uh, there's, uh, the architecture of it is interesting because you have multi-threaded JavaScript and, and simple JIT compilers instead of the full JIT compiler. I'm not going to go into that because I have no time and I also understand most of it not. But there's great talks about this by the people who write JavaScript engines who are all working together. So the V8 people learned a lot from that. We learned a lot from their stuff. We learned a lot from the Nitro engine or whatever it's called. And, uh, and of course, from Mozilla, everybody can look at their stuff anyways. 
So Chakra Core is not Chakra. So the, all the browser and universal Windows platform and the COM diagnostic APIs are not in that engine. It's only the JavaScript engine to run things with it. So all the DOM stuff you have to do somewhere else, but you mostly don't want to do it anyways. Or if you use React or something, you do a virtual DOM anyways. An interesting thing about the multi-threaded nature of Chakra is that you have something called time travel debugging now. If you want to take a look at that, it allows you to not only use a console log, but you can step forward and backward in your code. Woo. So instead of having a stop point, <laughs> you're not only having uh, this is the state right now, but it also keeps the history of the state. So you really know where the mutation problems happen. So you can go backward and forward in your code debugging. It's pretty awesome. Uh, and then, of course, what do we do now? We've got the V8 APIs, which are not standards, and we got Chakra Core, and then we built the Chakra Shim to make sure that your V8 code doesn't break in the, Chakra, uh, in the Chakra Core engine as well. And that was quite a lot of work. And uh, in this case, it's not bad, but it's, uh, I, I want to give another talk soon, and I, I saw a few people about this. The amount of times you use open source software and you use it in an environment where you have governments as your, uh, as, your, as your customers and these kind of things, the amount of rewriting we had to do when we used open libraries is incredible because whenever you release something, please, please, please think of internationalization and think of accessibility because otherwise we have to rewrite all your stuff again as well. There's more than one language on this planet, please support them. Anyways. Uh, Speed-wise, uh, the blue one is what Node was before. Uh, the, the yellow one is Node.js and Chakra with the old engine. And the green one is Node.js and Chakra Core. So we overtook the performance of, uh, um, uh, of original Node halfway through the process very, very quickly. And it's just going on and on right now. Um, the compile times uh, of TypeScript compilation uh, are going down as well. So this one, Node.js is the blue ones. Uh, green one is Node.js with Chakra Core. And that's just what we use internally for uh, TypeScript, for Visual Studio Code, which is written in TypeScript, Team Foundation Server, and the Encyclopedia app. Like, we use TypeScript a lot internally. And the cool thing is we don't even have to break other people's stuff. We want to just be faster in ourselves. So if you try these out, right now there's a virtual machine. You can, you can actually use a Windows machine if you wanted to. And I'm working very hard to get the Linux one out as well. It's open source on GitHub. Please file bugs. Please tell us about it and try it out. It's not that, I, that we get any money from that, but I want to break monoculture. I really do. I suffered Internet Explorer 6 long enough, so I'm happy to actually get money from Microsoft right now just for my pain that I had to endure for years and years. And this is monoculture, and we're doing monoculture here right now again as well. So looking ahead, Node should be the place where we kick the tires of JavaScript because we don't have the overhead of old environments. We don't have the overhead of not knowing where the thing is going to run because it's going to run on our own machines. So please try out new features of JavaScript in your Node, in your node solutions and don't just compile back to like the, late, the, the, the most compatible one because you don't need to. You control that thing. We build the tools we use to build things in Node. So let's not repeat the mistakes we did on the web. So our tools should be best practice in terms of quality as well. Like not just like put the thing together and be the first one to win Hacker News. By looking at our tools, we should learn the language. That's what I loved about YUI. YUI was never a jQuery contender, but I learned JavaScript by looking at, at, at a library. And that's pretty awesome. And we can do it with our solutions as well. We can educate developers in our tools rather than outside it. I just started using Visual Studio Code as my main editor, and I find these things autocomplete for Bezier curves in CSS, and I'm like, excellent. I don't need to understand what these numbers mean. And it actually tells me what the, what the Bezier prefill, what it does. We use linting. We use, uh, we use uh, 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 packing and all of these things in our tools. Put documentation in there as well. When somebody uses your tools in Atom or in Visual Studio Code or any of the other editors that we have that we can hack on, also flag up things that are people doing, uh, doing wrong while they're doing it. When, it writes a, when, when they write a function, say like, oh, have you thought about this? Because that's a problem if you don't think about that. How cool would it be to stay in our editors all the time and learn while we're actually coding? And there's a few startups in England that do machine learning on that stuff. There's some really good stuff coming that way. If we want Node to take off, we also need to embrace the needs of people outside our community. I'm talking to banks, I'm talking to insurance companies, I'm talking to people from the government. Uh, can't talk after that anymore, but I have to. And uh, when I tell them, like, hey, you can use this, it's like 12 beta versions, so five of them say in the documentation, not used for production. You should really try look at this environment. This is not how we sell this. Think about becoming more professional in our approach, because I want 
old, fragile browser environments to die. I want Node to be the number one server out there and server solution for people. But for that, we have to get out of our sandbox and actually start talking to people who have real needs that we might not understand, but we've been, we should be arrogant about it. So my hopes and wishes to finish up. Um, less drama and more documentary. Document your stuff, write good tutorials on Node and simple ones. Not like, okay, here's your first Node server, fair enough, we have all of those. But explain why dependencies are necessary, what dependencies do for you. Write, write solutions how you cannot pull live dependencies all the time, but how caching of dependencies would work. These kind of things. Rest, less shouting at each other, less trying to invent the future, but actually documenting what we're doing right now so the next people that come on the market have something to read rather than something to reinvent and tell us out, that we're outdated. Embrace constant change and avoid monoculture in anything. I don't really care if it's, if it's TV programs, if it's browsers. Monoculture is a dangerous thing. Don't forget to keep things simple. Don't tell people like you need these 50 dependencies and if you don't use that editor, you're not a really Node developer anyways. Embrace new ideas, embrace people and don't overload them with information. Watch this 50 minute video to learn Node, nobody's gonna do that. Five minute video step by step and explaining in between, much better idea. Stop making computer science a religion. The web was built by everybody. I don't have a computer science degree and I, I lecture at universities now about computer science, which is kind of bizarre. But we just, we just say, oh, this is how it has to be done because 1967, somebody did this in a, in, in, a, in a mainframe and that's probably how you should do it on IoT device as well. Embrace creative coding, embrace creative ideas and people coming from the outside. I want to see much more designers at Node conferences sitting around and, and nodding along and thinking like, oh, I understand that rather than like, oh my God, I'm just going to go out now because the last 50 minutes on the command line, I don't know what's going on there. User choice and user experience should always trump developer convenience. We make everything about developer convenience right now and we build huge solutions that should not run live in browsers. So let's slim that down and think about the end user's needs rather than our needs. And that's um, all I had, so thanks very much. <laughs>